First of all, thank you everyone who joined us today, who joined us tonight. It's a really big pleasure to see with such a big audience and uh, it's really a big pleasure to see the people who is actually interested in Java and then technology and engineering. Um, my name is Sergei Dorokin, I am head of the new organization in Post Switzerland. I also have a Java background, in the past I was a Java engineer and still trying to see uh, if I still can code, but sure I'm not, but <laughs> trying to do from time to time. I'm still enjoying it, right? And uh, I would like to say a few words about Epon, because probably it's also important to mention um, why you guys probably haven't heard the name of Epon in Switzerland market. Because we, uh, we are a US company, we were based 25 years ago, and uh, we preliminarily operated in the North America area and our customers was there. We established office here 10 years ago for the UBS, for, for our first line. The office was pretty small, just four people. Right now we operate in, in Switzerland and we have 400 engineers working for us, primarily Java developers. And uh, shame on us, but this is the first time we're doing such events. Uh, and uh, of course, we continue and planning to do it much more and much more often. Also, because we have like a crazy demand right now, we have 120 opening position, and we're really looking for the whatever engineer can join and join our team. But it's not only about the joining the team; it's all about the quality, the quality, technologies, skill set. That's all very important to us. It's we're ready to invest in it much more and uh, year after year. Um, so that was short, short discussion or short introduction from my side. And I would like to ask Peter Verkosh to step in and have a first presentation. Before that, short agenda for tonight. Thank you very much and uh, have a nice evening. Enjoy. to me from Hungary, an old, old friend of mine, and he said, are you talking about Kotlin? <laughs> <laughs> well, not really. And uh, so when we see that Java has the future, then we as uh, people working with this technology, we know it and we believe it. Otherwise, we wouldn't be Java developers. But why? What is really the future of Java? That's the big question. So, before going into the presentation, you have already, and uh, this presentation is about the future of Java. But to understand the future of something, we have to know the past and the present. So, where do we come from? Where are we with Java and where do we go from here? And the picture is actually the brief history of past, the present, and the future. Uh, not of Java, but the human mankind from Van Gogh. And uh, why I'm talking about this? Because I'm a Java expert, I'm a senior architect and lead developer. I work for Ethan, who is actually the organizer of this meeting. I wrote uh, two books, and uh, third one is a co author. I am mentoring. Uh, People. I have a blog where I have written uh, more than 100 articles in the past years and I many times speak at conferences. And the company is IPAM, uh, an engineering company uh, and uh, there are some slogans here that we are the digital future, we are Java engineers, Java architects, Java developers. But to look at really, uh, in addition to these slogans, we have 405 Java projects, I mean commercial projects with customers, and uh, 206 Java customers, so approximately two projects per customer. And there are more than 5,000 Java experts in this company, not in Switzerland, worldwide. We have several locations in Russia, Belarus, uh, Hungary, Poland. Let me not reiterate all the locations because uh, I want to talk about Java and not just this location in the coming uh, 35 minutes. So, 
generally we are Java very much. Java is the number one expert area in within IPAM, and we very much invest our future into Java. So if the whole company is ready to invest technologically into Java and focuses on Java, then probably there is a reason for that. So where do we come from? Brief history of the past. If you look at Java, in 1996 when it started, and it was Java 1.0, it was just uh, the time I was working for Digital Equipment Corporation, I was interested in Java and I was talking about it uh, to a salesperson, and then he said that, yeah, maybe it's the future, but right now it's a paper tiger. It's an American expression, it means that it may become one day a cat, and then can grow to a cougar and then a real tiger, but right now it's a paper tiger. But then we had version 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, and so on, and right now we are in Java 11. It was released in September 2018, and we already had Java 13, but the long-term support version is Java 11, which we usually use in production, or, well, Java 8 or 6 is used in production. But as far as I see, Java 6 is already really phasing out, and no kidding. There are some, still some legacy projects in Java 6, but usually Java 8 is the majority of the current projects in the industry, but also new projects focus on Java 11, and we go on. And uh, money-wise, because we also buy the bread, everybody buys the bread for money, so we are paid, and so we have to think about it. It's not only a hobby that we are doing, it's a profession. Java become from zero to a multi-billion dollar company, and it runs on servers, runs on mobile, runs on the desktop, runs on the tablets, and it even runs on Internet of Things, quote and quote, devices like the Mars rover. So it's running on a different planet. And it's memory optimized these days. It has a JIT compiler which runs native speed, which when I first was measuring, I, I was measuring it in a benchmark and I was really shocked that in some special benchmark it was faster than C. And then how? Because of the JIT compiler was optimizing it based on the actual statistics of the running data, not just pre-optimized without knowing what kind of data it will work on. We have secure server environment, we have the GVM, which is polyglot. You can run not only Java, but also Jiton, Kotlin, Groovy, Clojure, even Basic on GVM. And there are millions of frameworks, billions of libraries, and uh, zillions of average developers who can focus on Java projects. And what are we? Where are we with Java? What is Java? Well, when we are talking about Java, we have to talk about, we have to understand that Java is not one thing. When we are talking about Java, we talk about the language or the GVM or the, both together. But there are two different things that we have to distinguish. And when we are talking about the future of Java, we have to always know is it the language or is it the GVM that we are talking about, or the whole together? And when we look at that, it runs on desktop, it can be used for system programming, it can be used on the cloud, it can be used on the mobile, it can be used in the browser, not anymore, or not really, but still, it can be used in the browser. I will talk a little bit about it in IoT and definitely on servers. So, if uh, we look at that, uh, on the desktop we can have Java FX. On, uh, on the system, nobody will write uh, an operating system in Java, would be nonsense. Maybe technically possible, but I wouldn't really do that professionally. But some layered softwares definitely can be written in Java. Then in the cloud, we can use Java. On the mobile, we can use it on Android, definitely. It's a very native thing in Android. In the browser, there was Applet, but it's the past. And now we can use, and there are some projects that's using Vatin, if you are aware of the technology, or 
Google can do in toolkits, which is not really different from what they have some connections to each other. In IoT, there is a place for IoT, and Java is actually going for IoT with some of the features of the future Java. Even now, it's, it's already with Java 9 and 11, it's not even the future, it's the present. And on the server, no question. There are many, many things. Finance, insurance, telecom, Java is there. So, what's the, what are the strong points? The runtime envi environment, which is stable. Definitely stable. Uh, usually, the GVM doesn't crash. It runs for a month in operating environments, in production environments. It's managed. So when there is some memory shortage or whatever, there are tools that I can look into it. Not just, it's not just the compiled exe that runs and I have no idea how much memory it consumes. Well, the operating system tells me how much memory it consumes, but I have no idea. I cannot look inside what it uses that memory for. It's high performance. It's competing with native exe files, native compilation. And if I look at the language, the language is very mature. It's unparalleled to be. So the, uh, the integrated development environments uh, are the best for Java. I don't see anything. I tried Swift. I was trying Microsoft Visual Studio for different things. They don't come even closer to the Java environment. It's well known, obviously. And it's accepted, which is important in the case of the professional project because when somebody on a higher level in the business decides what technology should we use, should we use Ruby, Python, Kotlin, Java, then many times they decide that mm, if the project goes wrong, who will be blamed? If I choose Kotlin, that's a new thing. They may say that I am responsible, I was choosing Kotlin and maybe they will blame it on me. But if I choose Java as the technology, nobody can blame it. Java is not a problem. Then I can blame it on someone else, probably the programmers. But that's fine. And it has a very huge install base. Install base in terms of running code, almost as big as COBOL. Install base based on open source and available layer software, libraries, frameworks, tools, and install base of human brains, the programmers who know Java. Because when the guy in the business decides that we want to use Java, not Kotlin, why? Because we can hire Java developer easier. And on the other side, if I look at from the other side of the table, it also means that I will be able to find the Java projects easier than Kotlin projects. So if I know Java, I'm in a better position if I only know Kotlin. If I know both of them, that's really good. But profession-wise, it's Java. But there are also weak points. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any other language competing. What are these weak points? Well, if we look at the desktop, then we have big competitors in terms of languages like C Sharp and C++. Why? Because when you are dealing with some interactive program on the desktop, then we don't like if the garbage collector freezes. Like, as a gut feeling, if the garbage collector frees up one gigabyte of memory, it takes one second. And if I am playing with, let's say I'm playing a first-person shooter and it's written in Java and then I see the enemy and I want to shoot and then it just freezes for one second and I'm dead in the game. It doesn't work like that. So there is a big competition. And also, there is another thing that Java, when you start up, you are always knowing that Java first starts in uh, interpreted mode and then it collects the statistical data about running and then the just-in-time compiler kicks in and says that this part of the code was running many times with this type of data I optimize it, I compile it to native code and from now on that part is running natively but the startup is a little bit slower we also do not like that with the desktop application 
in system programming, uh, programming, we have a competition. C, C++ is very much established, and also perhaps Golang. And uh, the thing is about speed and thread allocation, and honestly, the memory footprint of Java, because Java is using really huge memory. If I compare to a C language program, then uh, Java definitely uses more memory, because it has a lot of memory in the heap, which is currently not used, but not yet connected. The string allocation, because UTF-16 is not really optimized in older Java, in newer Java it's better. And uh, that way, native languages like C, C++, which can be very much optimized regarding memory, can compete with Java in this area. To be honest, it takes hell of more time and effort to write these very optimized programs in C and C++ to write and do not crash than it would be in Java. But if we could do it in Java, why not? Speed, thread allocation again in the cloud. In the cloud, we stop and start programs very often. Therefore, we have the competition and also the competition comes from the fanciness of the languages and how easy it is to host something on the cloud, like Python, Ruby, JavaScript, Node. On the mobile, the competition is swift, and this is not really a technical kind of competition, but it's supported by Apple on the iOS. On Android, practically there is hardly any competition. If you go and program in Java or Kotlin on Android, it's very much famous on Android for some legal reasons, then you are good with Android. But with Swift, it's, uh, Apple is supporting very much Swift. And honestly, Swift is a very, very good and interesting language, by the way. I like a lot of language things in Swift, which is better than Java. Uh, on the server, we have a competition in COBOL. Nobody's laughing, but... <laughs> The thing is that uh, people think that COBOL is dead, but actually it's not dead. It's like, like when a forest is burning down, and you see this, it's not, it, it stopped. It's not burning anymore. You shouldn't go there bare feet, because for a very long time, even for weeks, and in case of COBOL, even for decades, it's still glowing hot under the thin film of ash on the top. So it's still there. But okay, then for the browser, hmm. we had security problems in the browser, really. Applets were a nightmare. It was not really usable. We, we can tell it now. We are in a small group, only Java developers. Uh, don't tell anyone outside of the cult, but uh, applets were not really a good idea. By the time, nobody could know it, of course. But and uh, these are issues of the past. And also, if uh, you want to download the whole Java environment into the browser, it doesn't work because the GDK is too huge. And uh, on IoT, the competition is C++. Again, uh, in real time things, garbage collection freeze shouldn't be there. It cannot survive. Imagine you drive your car. And then uh, the real-time system, the embedded system, uh, sees that the radar says that the car in front of us is we are approaching very fast on the highway, so we should brake. And then it signals that, and the other part, which is responsible for the brake, says that, okay, I will brake, but first I have to collect the garbage. After the collision, you really have to collect the garbage. <laughs> And also, IoT things usually have very small memory footprint and we don't want to squeeze the whole GDK into it. Because imagine that we have an IoT device which has a memory and this part is used for the GDK, so the environment, and this is the program. Then, what's the point? Really have such a huge environment to run a small program. So we can put Java almost everywhere. 
And uh, when a year ago I was putting Java for the future also on the browser, these days I would say that probably it's not going to be there. But I will talk a little bit about that. And uh, even though it's not about the future of the Java, it's the future of the Java developers. Because we always have to be open to new technologies which may not be Java. We shouldn't be identify ourselves as Java only developers. We are Java developers, but we also know Kotlin, JavaScript, and some other things. And there are some very interesting new technologies in the browser area these days. So, if we want to compete in other areas with Java, then Java has to solve these issues, really, and which are garbage correction delay, speed and thread allocation, memory issue, how much memory we use, the GDK size, and the security, if you remember the applet. So let's have a look at these, how we are dealing with this, how Java is dealing with this. First of all, garbage correction pause. We already have G1. Uh, garbage connector in Java 9. It became the major primary garbage connector. And the G1, the garbage first connector, you can set, you can configure how much time you allow the garbage connector to stop the world. Why nothing else works, only the garbage is collected. Because, you know, the garbage connector works in a way that it collects garbage while the program is running, but there is a small time when the garbage connector insists for a good reason that nobody else is touching the memory. Only the garbage connector. And then, for a limited time, the garbage connector owns the memory, not, no other thread is running. And with the G1 garbage connector, you can define the maximum time slice, or time amount, you would like to allow the garbage connector to stop the world. It's not guaranteed. It's not really a real-time garbage connector. But it does its best. And let's say that on a desktop, if somebody is playing first-person shooter and once in a while it happens that it freezes 10 milliseconds more, <coughs> ah, we can still live with it. Not in the game. Maybe in the game we are dead, but in real life, that may be acceptable. Also, it's very interesting that there is a garbage connector interface defined. So, using this interface, you can develop a garbage collector in Java language. Why is it interesting? Well, currently, it's not interesting for our tomorrow Java. But it's interesting for the future. Because if the garbage collectors, which are GBM specific, and if there is a GBM, uh, there is a garbage connector like the ZGC in Java 13 running on Linux, it may not run on macOS or on Windows, it doesn't. Why? Because it's written in C. But if it's written in Java, if we can write, we can code these algorithms in Java, and the Java Enhancement Proposal 304 just did that, and it's there in Java, this interface. Then, if somebody writes a garbage collector, a very advanced garbage collector, on one GBM, then it will run on the other one. No problem. It should be portable between the different processors, between the different GBMs. And the ZGC, the zero pose garbage collector, which was actually there for a long, long time as a separate commercial product from a company, and they were first selling it on a special hardware, then they were selling it only on Red Hat, and it's kind of integrated with the operating system, and it works in a way that it doesn't need to stop the world, because it applies a special technique, but to do that, it needs to communicate with the operating system, so that uh, actually when the garbage collector stops the world, it needed because it doesn't want any program, any thread, touch 
certain objects which are on the movement. With the ZGC, if any code tries to touch any object which is on the movement, then uh, the operating system will cause a page fault, which is a technology which is done by the operating system every day. If I want to do it in the GVM level, it would be unbearably slow. It doesn't work. But if I can integrate it into the operating system, then it's not slower than, the, than it's usually. And with this one, we can really have no stopping for the garbage collector. And uh, it was released in the GDK 11, but it's still limited to Linux 64 and not on other operating systems. So there is a lot of things going on on the garbage collection front. And security. Hmm. Is Java secure? If you ask a Java developer about the GDK, the GVM and the Java language, then we say, yes, of course, it's no question. But when we are talking about business people or people who are not that familiar with Java, then they say that Java is not secure. But why? It's an old perception. And honestly, it was really true that there were a lot of problems, a lot of security issues with applets when the Java was integrated into the browser and actually the sandboxing around Java was not good enough. And these people, even though we don't use Applet for like 5-10 years, they still believe that Java is not secure. Why? Why don't they change their mind? The thing is, it's probably the evolution. The evolution of the human brain. That for ten thousands of years, we were living, we were foragers, we were living in the wild. And if somebody at the age of three, four has learned that this animal is dangerous, then if he was revalidating it at the age of 15 and tried uh, to uh, caress a lion, then probably it was lethal and his gene was not given to the ancestors. So our brain works in a way that once we have learned that the lion is dangerous, we stick to that. We have learned it. This is a fact. Lion is dangerous. Java is not secure. It's dangerous. It's not secure. Okay, but the thing is that Java is not the lion anymore. It's not the same Java that we are talking about. If anyone wanted to program today in Java 1.2 and using applets, of course, you are brain dead. You are touching the lion. You shouldn't. But when you try not to touch the oranges, which are juicy and nutritious food, then you will hang your die because Java is not a lion anymore. So, uh, what about uh, Applet? Java is uh, not, even Applet was deprecated because nobody was using it. The browsers actually deleted it from themselves in all versions, even while it was supported within Java, and it's not part of the modern Java anymore. So, next question hmm. browser, WebAssembly. It's a very interesting thing. Who has heard about WebAssembly? Quite a few people, it's very good. WebAssembly is a binary language which is executed by the browser. You can program WebAssembly in many different languages compiled to this binary code and then it runs in the browser. It's not a plugin, it's part of the browser. Already the current version of the most of the browsers support it. You may not know it, but it supports it. And because it's a binary language, the, the, the first language that uh, is compiled to it is Rust, which is also a very interesting language, and if you want to learn something other than Java, I can suggest Rust. But there are also other languages that can be compiled to WebAssembly, and uh, I think they, they say that 
uh, it's not competing with JavaScript, but I think that in the long run it will compete with JavaScript. And a year ago I was thinking about maybe Java can also be compiled through GVM bytecode to WebAssembly, but I think it, even though it technically could be possible, it may not happen because there are no initiatives for that direction, but it would have been very interesting. We have different other languages for the browser. And if you remember that we had several areas, if we don't have the browser as Java programmers, we can live with that. GDK size, IoT devices typically. The GDK in Java 9, introducing the Java platform module system, was also the GDK was split up into several modules and now it's possible to create a runtime that includes only the part of the GDK that our application is using. So if I have an IoT program that uses only the Java base module and not the XML or any other module out of, I think there are something like 20, more, 20 and more uh, modules inside the GDK, then I can have a runtime which includes only that part of the GDK. Memory. That's also a very interesting thing that will come very soon into uh, Java. There is a project, Valhalla, for value objects. And uh, you can already download a version of Java that you can play with value objects. And what is a value object? Value object is a it's, in other languages, it's called record or struct. So it's not an object, it's just a piece of memory where there, the data is there. And when I, why it's so important? Because when I have an array of something, like objects, then what I really have is an array of references, and each reference points to an object. And even though there are algorithms that try to organized in the garbage collector that if these objects are referenced from an array, then let's put them together into one memory page, or as close as possible. But still, when the program tries to access one element of the array, then it accesses the reference. It's very fast because it's already in the CPU cache, and then it reaches out to the memory, which is 10 times slower, give or take, approximately. Then it tries to access the next element, but in the CPU cache, I only have an object reference, except if it's an array of primitives, but value types are kind of records which are extension of primitives. So, honestly, primitives are kind of value types, very simple value types, and so on. If I create records, then the array becomes the array of the values, the array of uh, the objects, but these are not objects, so they don't have the header, so it's smaller. And because they come one after the other, when the program runs through an array, and it's very common that we go through an array, then it's already there in the memory. And many programs can be much faster and use this uh, smaller memory footprint. The next thing is speed. Uh, actually, when we are talking about speed, then what are we talking about? It's already Formula 1. Java is very fast. And again, Java is slow is an odd perception. Java is not slow anymore. It, maybe it was slow, but with the just-in-time compiler, it's not slow anymore. And it gets even faster with a new virtual machine, the Graal VM, which is a, a new VM from Oracle. It's written up from scratch. And uh, the early measurement says that it's 20% faster than the current GVM. And it does a lot of optimization. It's open source. And it has some very specific and very interesting features. <coughs> Who knows what is LLVM? It's a framework. No, no, no. LLVM 
is uh, by, uh, is a special bytecode, and uh, and uh, when you compile a compiled language code like C or Go, but Go is uh, compiled differently. But many languages can compile to LLVM, and then the compiler don't, you don't need to write uh, bytecode uh, uh, native code generator because you have the native code generator and optimizer from LLVM to uh, different processors. So LLVM, it's, it's a VM stands for virtual machine, but it's not really a virtual machine, it's not interpreted, but it's compiled to native code. And uh, it's possible to compile it from LLVM to GraalVM, which means that if you compile a C code to LLVM, and from LLVM to Graal, and you also compile Java to GVM, which is compatible with Graal, then you can invoke C code from Java and Java code from C and many other things, whatever can be compiled to LLVM. So this way, uh, it was always a little bit difficult to call a native code from uh, Java because there is a synchronization issue with the Java native interface, but with GraalVM, the VM becomes really polyglot. And yeah, and it runs even JavaScript. And therefore, when you, you include JavaScript in an application, during the startup, you will get a warning that Rhino will be deprecated. Because why do you need a JavaScript interpreter? And you can compile the JavaScript into VM, and then it can be run by Graal VM. The normal GVM cannot do that because GraalVM is extended and does more than the normal GVM, but it can also run in GVM code. Speed and thread allocation, also a very, very interesting thing for multi-thread uh, programming. There are fibers introduced in Project U, and uh, these will be even faster than threads, because if you look at the history, then multi concurrent programming originally was multi-process. So for example, the Apache Web Server 1.3 or 1. anything was a single thread multi-process server. Then the Apache 2.0 was single process multi-thread. Why? Because the processes have their own memory space. The threads run in a single process and they share the memory. They still have separate stacks, core stack, with fibers, we have even shared stack, which seems to be a little bit crazy at first, but it's really not. And also, the context switching between the different uh, uh, fibers is much cheaper than context switching between different threads. So, if we look at this, and we have seen the current version of where we are, then a little bit exaggerating, I can say that in the future, we will be there, everywhere. Java is not going to be dead in the near future. And I don't know if you are familiar with the Boston Consulting Group uh, model about product life cycle. Boston Consulting Group says that when you have, you have a company, you have different projects, pro different products, that uh, some are just new ideas. You have to invest into them, that's research. There are some rising stars which do not really sell good enough yet, but they have the future. We believe in them. You have to invest into them. And then there are the so-called cash cows that are not really new, but they produce a lot of memory, typically cobalt, something like that. And there are, the, they call it dead talks. Actually, but I didn't want to put a, a picture of a dead dog, so I would say it's a sad dog, okay? 
And the question is for us, if we look at Java as a product, and not a company, but a whole industry, then where is Java? Is it in introduction? Not anymore. Is it in growth? Is it in a maturity state as a cash cow? Or is it in decline? And many people, those people who uh, say that when I'm, I say uh, that I'm talking about the future in Java and they ask me back that uh, you speak about Kotlin, then they think that this is the position of Java. But based on what I can see in the current releases and what is communicated by Oracle for the future, what I can see in the Java enhancement proposal, what I can see with the open source downloadable things and I can try out, the Java is somewhere here. And then the last question is, where should we go in the future as developers? Here are the URLs. You can go and read the OpenGDK Java.net for new proposal. Then you can uh, read about the, the same Java flow, about the fibers. You can download the Graal. There is an official Graal repository on GitHub. Uh, if you are interested in LLVM, that's not really Java, but I mentioned it, it's LLVM org. WebAssembly, it's not Java, but I recommend that you have a look at it, understand at least what it is, and then you decide whether you want to invest your time and brain learning it a little bit deeper or not, is at WebAssembly.org. And uh, if uh, for the, the zero garbage collector, uh, there is also a wiki page on the OpenGDK. And what you really should learn as Java developer, if you haven't learned yet, and it's not easy, but it's very important, is the Java uh, platform module system, which you can have a very good tutorial from uh, uh, Nikolai on his blog, blog at, at CodeFX. So, everybody made a picture who wants it. I think we will publish it by the way. It's here. So, as a summary, to be a little bit more easy to and be more, a little bit marketing, Epon, Java is the future. And we are Java. So, we are the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.